recipients of the training. And this year is the second lot of prosecutors. And there are two different stages of the program, diplomas in police, prosecuting and certificates in distance education stage. Out of the 37, 25 completed the first stage, while 12 completed the second stage. A one-day National Fisheries Authority consultation meeting took place on yesterday. The objective developing non-tuna fisheries market in Singapore and China mainland. NFA Managing Director Justin Ilakini highlighted how the NFA is implementing programs to expand commercial activities in non-tuna sectors, primarily coastal and inshore resources. And also look at the Chinese market. If you look at the Chinese market and the Southeast Asian market, the market demands more of uh, the kind of uh, fisheries and modern resources that our people harvest. The crabs, the lobster, the reef fin fish, beach steamer, and all those are uh, all those marine products. So, importantly, the the consultation here will will talk about how our people can better access those markets. The remains of two Australian World War II officers have been positively identified 79 years after the aircraft crash in waters south of Papua New Guinea, following a search mission by a mining magnate, three Queensland men and a Tasmanian were on board the number 100 Quadron, 100 SQN, World War II befront aircraft when it went missing south of Gasmata in 1943. A memorial of the families of all four crew is set down for April 26th this year at a rough base in Bali. The aircraft identified plate and cockpit lever were recovered from the site and will be returned to Australia under a permit granted by the PNG National Museum and Art Gallery. Muslims across the capital begin celebrating the holy month of Ramadan Today for the festive of Eid, prayers and the breakfast of fast were held at Gunalin Mosque early this morning. Side by side, after 29 days of spiritual growth and connection. Allah. Around 1,500 worshippers attending the second of two prayers to mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. We are celebrating uh, daily iftar here, so uh, we are preparing iftar for more than 300 to 500, sometimes reach to 1,000. A mosque with a growing community, embracing all ages and representing more than 50 nationalities. There are people from you know the subcontinent, people from Africa, people from Middle East, people from you know various parts of the world. After the prayers, families gather to feast, with children receiving special gifts called Eidi. I will be eating a lots of that candy, and I'm going to get lots of Eidi. It feels good because I I like food. Sometimes. It, it was really hard because like sometimes I have stomach aches and stuff because I was really hungry. Ramadan is observed by more than 800,000 Muslims across Australia and up to 8,000 people here in the capital. It's a month of reflection and thinking of their brothers and sisters from across the globe. Our sadness for uh, people of Gaza, it was always there, you know, like we prayed for them and we tried to help and send uh, as much uh, help as we can, you know, from an uh, individual perspective. We all wish for world peace, and this will not happen, not unless we all unite as people, not by religion, not by race, um, and it is here to do that. Coming together to celebrate what unites us. A refugee advocacy group has raised the alarm over treatment of a growing number of people transferred to the Nahuru detention facility. It comes after a third suspected asylum seeker group in five months was found on Western Australia's Kimberley coastline and sent to remote Micronesian Island. This concern a historic track record of human rights abuses experienced by detainees is continuing.
on the coast and sent to Nauru. Now advocates say they have human rights concerns after making contact with arrivals. We've spoken to 38 out of 64. Mid last year, the processing centre on the small island north of Australia was vacant. But after a first group was intercepted in Australian waters in September, three more suspected asylum seeker groups have been found. One near Truscott Air Base in November, a second near Beagle Bay in February, and a third group again near Truscott last weekend. All 61 people were taken to Nauru for processing, Advocates have been talking to members of the group found in February. They are experiencing anxiety and depression and, um, and suicidal feelings. Caseworkers say their main concerns are a lack of adequate access to telecommunications with smartphones replaced by simpler models on arrival, no trauma-informed counselling and restricted access to human rights organisation websites on shared computers. What should be happening is when people arrive in Nauru, um, they should be given access to uh, legal assistance. The Department of Immigration says people at the Nauru Detention Centre are treated with respect, dignity and in accordance with human rights standards. It also says it's the Nauruan government's responsibility to process and manage maritime arrivals, including ensuring their welfare and access to services. It, it's extremely important that the Australian government learns from its past mistakes, from the human rights abuses that occurred, um, from the harm that indefinite detention causes challenges faced by so many others seeking a new life in Australia. Fewer dolphins damage to aquaculture and faster climate change. These are some of the concerns being shared with the Senate inquiry sitting in Darwin which is investigating rather investigating 1.5 billion dollars in federal government funding for a massive new gas processing and industry precinct. The anti-government and the gas industry are arguing the economic benefits of the middle arm will outright the risk. Out. Doctors and nurses are among concerned groups giving evidence to the Senate inquiry, examining the NT and federal government's planned gas processing and industrial precinct at middle arm voicing concerns about air and water pollution. I don't feel that the government is taking these, these health impacts seriously. Scientists who've recorded a decline in dolphin numbers with industrialisation are warning another port and dredging for another shipping channel will make things worse. We now um, are going to see more and more decline. The fears are shared by aquaculture businesses with harbour hatcheries. It's really important that you know, uh, new businesses coming in don't uh, get uh, put in at the expense of existing in industries and jobs. And harbour tourism businesses. We used to see dolphins quite frequently, the odd dugong, turtles. These days they're a lot, they're a lot uh, hard to find. Anglers are worried about dredging and access to the Elizabeth River being blocked. They want Darwin's existing port to be used instead before that dredging is done, because the dredging can't be undone. An anti-government commissioned draft social impact study found all these concerns should be considered medium or high risk, and greenhouse emissions from the project will be huge. The gas industry is promising many project emissions will be trapped underground. The middle arm will very much play a key part to enable carbon storage not only for Australian projects, but also for other global operators. The inquiry has also heard passionate opposition from Indigenous traditional owners, saying the development will damage their Darwin Sea country and they don't want fracking on their land in the Beetaloo Basin to supply it. This big gas company had no clue about my country. The NT government's dismissing concerns. I'll be speaking very strongly around how important, uh, how important middle arm is to the economy of the Northern Territory. The Chief Minister will be questioned on Thursday morning. In sports, uh, the introduction of the PNG NRL bid junior development program in Lay City has seen increased participation of schools and teams per division. Lay Schools Rugby League coordinator Charlie Ticaro has revealed. 
After last weekend's round three of the lay school's rugby league competition, Dikaro said the number of teams has increased in season 2024. Dikaro said participating schools have increased to three teams per division in their respective categories under 15, under 17 and under 19 year olds. We have also Busu coming on board. Last year Busu decided not to take part, that, that was administrative uh, direction. But this year they changed their mind again and now they are joining the competition. Uh, they play next. So that's Busu. We also have Puman and the number of schools, I mean, the teams also increase in each schools. Like Lasek, we have three teams, Busu two teams for under 17, uh, Bumayon two teams for under 17, Bugendi two teams, so the teams numbers have increased. That's why we have to have two fields for the games. Uh, Lake Secondary School is running the, also the primary schools, and Bugendi we are running the uh, secondary school com. He added the introduction of the PNG NRLC B Junior Development Program has boosted the competition expected to be bigger and better next year. Dikaro further acknowledged the Lay Biscuit and Prima Small Goods Company to have been the number one sponsor of the competition since day one, even before the inception of the PNG NRLB Junior Program. You can see some of the dresses that the students are wearing now are sponsored by the Prima and Lay Biscuit Company. Okay, so they have been good to us for so long uh, without the sponsorship from the other sources. They have been with us since day one up until now. And uh, I'd just like to uh, commend the uh, support given by Lay Biscuit Company and Prima Small Goods, the so, so family, and also the two schools, Bugendi Secondary School and Lay Secondary School. As well as adding that usage of school values, including electricity, water and ablutions, have always been free of charge to the respective school's expenses. Lay Secondary School, especially ever since the school rugby league, uh, competition coming to our city. We have been using the facility, the water, the toilet, power, chairs, table, and the field. We have been using it for free. It's quite a voluntary job that we use teachers here. It's a voluntary job, but because of the support that is given by our business houses like Lapes Company, uh, Prima Small Goods, because of that support, we are here just to answer our students like pursue their career in, in, in sports, especially rugby. Terry Longwood, TV One Sports. Tennis, a progress in sport played in Papua New Guinea and is doing well among youngsters on the international stage. This week, a total of 14 medals was bagged by our junior tennis players at the worst Pacific qualifiers in Lautoka, Fiji. An impressive performance it was for the youngsters, including five fresh faces and rather as young as 10-year-olds taking the courts. The kids participated in the under-12, under-14 and under-16 divisions in the boys and girls category and singles. According to coach Eddie Mera, this was the first time PNG had done extremely well in its junior tournament and looks forward to the next tournament in June 2024. The team of youngsters returned yesterday with their spoils and works congratulated at the welcome reception at the Port Mosby Record Club. And that ends the midday news update. Join us for more at 6 p.m.